everybody. Um, my name's Lawrence Lomax, and I'm one of uh, three presenters here today to talk to you about reliable code at scale. With me today are Jules and Andrea. I'll do the kickoff and then hand over to Jules. So I've been at Facebook London for nearly five years now and worked on a bunch of different projects in that time. But what has remained uh, consistent over all of these projects is thinking about mobile app reliability and how to stay on top of this in far, uh, Facebook's large and fast moving code base. But just to get started, perhaps one of the best ways of thinking about what um, reliable code means is to use the counterexample of unreliable code. So this is what we really don't want to see. Crashes, hangs, or other kinds of bad behavior that frustrates users. This does represent the absolute worst case scenario where an app is shipped uh, to users and they start to experience uh, things like crashes. Discovering a crasher or some other kind of regression to software quality at this stage in the release cycle has a, a very high cost. It's a high cost in terms of uh, um, user experience, but there's also a very high uh, cost to engineers as the time taken to diagnose and fix issues in a live application uh, is a big context uh, switch away from the usual development cycle. The flip side of this is that if we do catch regressions much earlier in the release process, such as during code review, um, this is never shipped to users and there's no real uh, user impact. And um, code review is is part of a developer's day-to-day -day workflow. Code review is needed before any changes are shipped to, to, to the main code base. For the person changing code, it allows them to get feedback on their changes, including any potential regressions that they didn't anticipate. For the person reviewing, it's an opportunity to give feedback, maybe make detail about a regression, and give them more context on the changes that they may be making. This means that the most suitable reviewers are often those who are most familiar with the code being changed. However, this can begin to break down in large and interconnected code bases, such as Facebook's. With large code bases, it's simply not possible for reviewers to have the full picture of the code base when reviewing changes. This means that human reviewers can miss um, many important regressions to reliability and even catastrophic um, changes such as crashes. On the other hand, automation thrives at vast scale. Uh, if we can remove some of the burden of finding regressions from humans and push it towards automation, we can help to catch regressions at Facebook scale. And we already have a perfect place for automation to get involved during the code review process. Automation becomes a code reviewer alongside its human peers. That's what we'll be all talking about today, how Facebook uses automation to deliver reliable code at scale. First up, Jules will be talking about Infer. Infer is a static analysis tool for finding bugs in code without the code even being executed. Secondly, Andrea will come to the stage to talk about Sapiens. It's an automatic test generation tool that explores the user interface of an application to find crashes at runtime. Finally, I'll be back to talk about iOS automation with IDB. Scaling up automated testing on iOS has a unique set of challenges, so you'll learn what some of these challenges are and how Facebook uses IDB to solve them. So I'll now hand over to Jules, so please welcome him onto the stage. All right, uh, thanks, Lawrence. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jules Villard. I'm uh, also a software engineer in Facebook London. And in a previous life, I was uh, an academic researcher working on static analysis. And four years ago, I joined Facebook to work on Infer. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Infer is a static analyzer. This means it works a bit like a compiler and tries to understand the source code itself without even running it. And Concretely, it tries to understand each function and method in a code project to detect certain classes of errors. One of the defining characteristics of infer is that it's going for those deep bugs, and by which I mean bugs that can involve multiple functions spanning multiple classes, possibly in different files in your project. And it's also trying to catch 
fairly complex issues, such as null de reference, uh, race conditions, uh, so a bit more about that later. This kind of bugs can easily be missed by humans, uh, as Lawrence mentioned in the introduction. And the other defining characteristic of Infer is that it tries to find these deep, complex bugs fast. Um, so it scales to the tens of millions of lines of code that we have at Facebook. Concretely, the goal is for Infer's performance to be roughly on par with that of a compiler, maybe slower, sometimes faster, sometimes slower. But Infer is also incremental, meaning that analyzing code changes typically takes a matter of minutes, even on very large code bases. So to start off, uh, give you a concrete idea of what Infer can do, let's look at an example. So take this Java code, um, it's a simple method to feed a pet monster uh, who eats carrots, and because it's a monster, it eats baby carrots. And this function only does two things. It first retrieves a carrot from a carrot patch, and then it feeds that as argument to monster.eat so that it eats it. So let's say Infer starts analyzing that piece of code, trying to look for null pointer exceptions. What Infer will do is go through the code line by line, trying to understand what it does, and at the same time summarize its behavior. The first line here is a method call to get baby carrot. Infer doesn't know what that does yet, so what it would do is pause the analysis of the current method to go and analyze this other method, get baby carrot. So here's the code for that. It's uh, possibly in a different file, um, dealing with all vegetable-related features of your program. And here, in fair again, we go line by line, trying to understand what the function does. And let's keep over that, but what it would compute as a summary is that this method doesn't expect anything as input. And um, after it finishes executing, it returns a value that's either null or a valid caret. And this summarization step is crucial for infer to scale because what happens is that once it's analyzed this method and summarized it, it will never need to analyze it again. And it will reuse that summary everywhere that method is called. So now that we have this summary, we can go back to our main task, analyzing feed monster. So Infer will apply the summary and deduce that caret at this point in the program can either be null or a valid caret. And then it will go on the next line, which is another method call. So again, it will pause the analysis, first analyze that method once and for all, and then come back. So monster.eat is very simple, and Infer will summarize what this function does as expecting a valid caret as input because it's accessing some of these fields. And after the function has executed, it returns a, the same caret uh, with a calorie count of zero. So now we can finish analyzing feed monster. So Infer now tries to apply the summary of eat to the caret it has, but the summary says caret must be valid, and Infer, on the other hand, already computed that caret at this point can be valid, but it can also be null, so there's strong suspicion that this code could generate a null pointer exception at runtime. So Infer will report at this point. Sorry. And that's all for this example of what Infer can do. So now things are great. We have a tool that can find bugs in code, but that's only half the equation. And at Facebook, we have lots of code and lots of developers working on that code. And that's the other half of the equation. How do we deploy Infer in a way that's uh, as useful as possible to these developers? So perhaps the most obvious idea is to take all the code, run Infer on it, and get back a fairly large list of bugs in that case, and then take these bugs and show them to developers. And the idea of doing that is that developers will be delighted to hear about all these bugs and fix all of them, and then everything will be perfect, the app will never crash again, right? Well, so unfortunately in the real world, almost no bugs get fixed that way. Uh, so the reason is that, um, I mean, there are probably many reasons, but I think one of the main ones, as uh, Lawrence alluded to in his introduction, is that these reports are about old code that developers are no longer working on. So Going back to this old code and trying to figure out uh, if each report is, uh, what each report is about, let alone fix it, is going to require a huge context switch from the developers. And um, 
they will have a very hard time prioritizing this kind of work over the next feature they're already working on. But this suggests a better approach to integrating the developer workflow as much as possible. So at Facebook, as Lawrence said, we do code review. And for that, we use Fabricator, another open source tool. So when a developer sends a code change for review, it gets sent to human reviewers who will comment on the code, and at the same time, some continuous integration kicks in. I will run tests and checks, and in particular, I will give the code change for, to Infer uh, for analysis. And so Infer will analyze the code and report any potential new bugs that are introduced by the code change directly to the uh, code review tool, like a, just like a human reviewer would. So instead of a long list of bugs about all code, the developer will see Infer comment on the code they are actively working on at the moment. And uh, in our experience, this, uh, this leads to uh, developers acting on these reports a lot more than with the previous uh, workflow. So far, I've only talked about net the referencer, but uh, Infer can catch a lot more bug types, most of them fairly complex, like resource leaks, race conditions, security properties, deadlocks, many more. And these analyses are developed based on the needs of developers, so it's always great to hear back from them when Infer codes something cool for them. So for instance, this Facebook developer reported that Infer prevented a race condition in a code change that was accessing a data structure without proper locking, and thought it was pretty cool. So um, if you want to be as happy as this person, uh, you can come to our classroom at 2 p.m. to learn more about what Infer can do for you. And before I wrap up, I want to introduce a new analysis built into Infer that we just released uh, last week in our latest GitHub release. And that analysis uh, perform performs a compu computational cost analysis. So. What it does is uh, now Infer can give you information about how fast your code, will, your code will run, more precisely, its time complexity. In this code, the function ITER list uh, takes a list and does something for each of the, its elements. And so Infer will be able to report that uh, that function will run in a time proportional to the length of the list, list pass as argument. And if we just Go to a little bit more complex example. Now let's take this function and call it repeatedly in a loop, count times. Then Infer will tell you that this function runs uh, in big O of the count parameter times the length of the list parameter. So at Facebook, this analysis is integrated in two ways. Uh, first, developers in their um, editor, in their IDE, can hover over function names to get this information about how fast each function runs. And secondly, it's also integrated in our analysis of code changes to detect performance regressions. So here's how this looks. Let's take the same code, but assume initially do count times did nothing in its main loop, and the developer sends a code change to call ITER list instead. Infer will report at that point that the, the cost of this function has increased significantly uh, to the developer, just to, so the developer can double check that this is what they intended. Right, that's pretty much it from Infer. At Facebook, Infer is used to help developers write high quality code for all our Android and iOS apps, as well as all our backend code that's in Java or C++. Uh, that represents a volume of tens of thousands of diffs, code changes being analyzed every month, and thousands of issues being fixed by developers. And this, um, most of the reports made by Infer are acted on. Infer is open source, available from fbinfer.com or our GitHub. So go get it, test it, run it on your project, find all these cool bugs. But before you do that, first listen to Andrea describing Sapiens, another system we develop and use at Facebook to give high quality signal to developers. Thanks. Please welcome Andrea for me. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thanks, Jules. Uh, my name is Andrea Ciancone. Um, I'm passionate about writing software that help developers to build applications that are reliable and high quality. That's why I'm working on Sapiens, a technology that is able to automatically test an application using machine-generated tests. 
Testing an application is a challenging business. If you test your application writing um, tests or you do it by hand, um, you face every day all the challenge that testing um, is requiring you to, to take care of. Um, so the first challenge is to make sure that you are testing properly all the features of your application. And if you want to be accurate, you want to also make sure that you are checking the functionality in all the device that you want to support. And also, all the version that you want to support, right? Different operating system version. The second challenge is making sure that the, the test by themselves has have high quality. Tests can suffer of flakiness. So this means that, for example, if you run a test that use the network or run on a real device, uh, can fail because the infrastructure has, a, has an issue, has some kind of uh, random failure. And whenever a test fails for this reason, is slowing down the development process and also undermine the trust on test itself. Also, test needs to be maintained to update with the, the speed the code change is happening. Otherwise, test will become very quickly like irrelevant and useless. Finally, tests are written for checking functionality you, you think through. Uh, and this means that, for example, if you have some random behavior in your application because um, a race condition in your code, or you have some uh, unknown behavior in a third-party library, just for example, uh, this can cause issues in production even though your test will be completely successful. For all this reason, in Facebook, we um, support uh, developers and uh, quality, uh, quality insurance people uh, with Sapiens. Sapiens is a, a technology that is rooted into search-based uh, software engineering. This is an active research area where the Sapiens team is uh, continuously contributing to. When, when Sapiens uh, run tests, um, is interacting on the interface as a user do. This means that is scrolling in the interface uh, tapping different elements in the UI, and also inserting text um, in text fields. In this way, can um, build end-to-end -end tests that are able to give like a good confidence uh, on the reliability of the application, and also explore the different part of the application. While Sapiens is doing the testing on the application, is also continuously checking what is the status of the device and the application under test. In this way, uh, if any issues is, uh, is happening, so for example, the application is crashing or is slowing down, can immediately take all the information available, including logs, a video of the tests, and then report it this back. Sapiens is able to run on many different type of devices, and in Facebook we have um, different runtime environments that can be used for this purpose. We have devices like tablet, we have smartphones, we have Oculus devices and set, for example, but also we have browsers and any type of um, emulators that you can use for, for that. And Sapiens is using all this runtime environment uh, thanks to an on-demand service that is called OneWord. OneWord is Facebook solution for um, managing um, devices for large-scale testing. The test engine of Sapiens is running on a separate host from the runtime environment and is using very simple primitive for accessing uh, to the, the runtime and controlling it, as well as sending a gesture or any kind of user interactions to, to the device and also to inspect the state. So for example, can check at any point in time what is um, visible on the screen, so what kind of elements can interact with, can check the logs of the device, as well as how is the application under test behaving. One word, as we said, um, is providing the remote connection to, to the runtime environment where the tests are running. And on the runtime environment, Sapiens has a controller specifically for each device that use for um, control the application and inject all the kind of uh, information are requested. 
The controller is different for different type of uh, devices. And for example, in Android, we use ADB, that is the Android debugging tool, that allow us uh, to install the application and run and launch the application uh, when we are ready to test. As Jules and uh, Lawrence describe, it's really uh, beneficial to provide quality uh, information on the code early in the development stage. Sapien's strategy for that is based on three main points. First of all, is having smart tests that can provide high quality results to the developer. Second, having uh, Sapien's running automatically inside the continuous integration. And third, parallelize the execution of the tests. Let's see how a test um, works. So, Sapiens has a, a running process that is continuously exploring, uh, so run on continuous base, um, the application structure. And the purpose of this is to learn how the application looks like, how, uh, create, how to create a test that is able to properly inspect the content and reach different parts of the application. Whenever a test case, a pro a test case is fine, some in, in, uh, interesting test case, this is saved in a database that is then available at time at the time to test the code change. So in, with this approach, we are able to, to do the testing in a quicker way and also with higher quality. Whenever an engineer is, is um, creating a, a code change, Fabricator is, is automatically notifying the continuous integration system. The continuous integration system in turn is creating a new version of the app, so it's building a new uh, release that is then passed to Sapiens. At this point, Sapiens can immediately look at for the best tests to run for testing the code change and immediately test it. And whenever an issue is identified on the uh, new version of the app, then it automatically try to figure out which part of the code of the code change uh, caused the issue. So for this reason, it has an automatic uh, localization um, triaging mechanism that identify where, um, what is the part of the code that is involved in the issue. And once this is done, it has all the elements to comment back on the on fabricator, uh, giving information like a video of the, the crash and all the other information um, on the device, of the device. Sapiens um, is able to parallelize the execution of tests, and for doing that, is asking to one word multiple devices where it can run tests in parallel. In this way, once um, it starts testing, it's able in, in an order of minutes to execute all the tests and provide results to the developer. So, the ability to, to parallelize the execution uh, of Sapiens is mainly controlled by the number of emulators that we are providing to Sapiens. So depending on how much you want to, how much resources you want to allocate for, for testing. And uh, in, uh, in Facebook, we are able to successfully scale to 100,000 different uh, code change tested per week. And for doing that, uh, Sapiens is using on a continuous basis, base hundreds of emulators uh, that runs, uh, run tests. The Sapiens team initially developed um, Sapiens technology uh, for um, Facebook on Android. And the last year, we were very busy in trying to introduce Sapiens to all the other technology uh, and the other application of the fa Facebook family. Currently, Sapiens is testing um, the code for um, Andro um, so, uh, Facebook for Android, uh, Facebook for iOS, as well as Messenger, Instagram, and Workplace for Android. Uh, so this means that if you're, whenever you're using any of this application, you're using an application that has been automatically tested by Sapiens. In order to be able to run tests on um, Facebook for iOS, we had to, to um, achieve like a better um, set of tooling for automatically testing um, application on iOS. And um, regarding so, I will introduce again uh, Lawrence that will now describe 
how we were able to achieve automatic testing of uh, iOS application. Thank you. Hello. Um, hello again. Uh, as Andrea just mentioned, Sapiens used to run exclusively on Android emulators, but has recently added iOS support. So how do we do this? Sapiens uses hundreds of Android emulators concurrently to provide timely feedback during the code review process. All of these Android emulators are running in our data center. Android has a bunch of existing tooling that is used to perform uh, operations, such as simulating touch gestures, uh, getting user interface states from the Android operating system. This is then used by Sapiens to execute uh, against a remote Android emulator, which then it, it is then used to execute a test sequence. There's a, obviously a strong motivation to test our iOS apps uh, using Sapiens too. The most effective way of doing this is to use iOS simulators. These simulators are part of the standard um, iOS toolchain. There's a lot of existing tooling here, but there are a number of reasons why we couldn't get by with the standard iOS toolchain. So what were these problems that we needed to overcome? With the existing developer toolchain, a typical automation workflow um, may involve a handful of iOS simulators running on a single Mac. When one long running uh, automation can be broken down into a set of smaller ones, it's possible to get test results sooner by running concurrently on, against many simulators. Obviously, this is very important when we're trying to get uh, signal on code changes. As existing tooling runs locally on a single machine, the maximum concurrency is limited to the handful of iOS simulators that can be run on a single Mac. And perhaps there are other machines that are more uh, suitable for orchestrating these automations. Sapiens is more efficient when it runs on a powerful machine learning box instead of on a Mac mini. The approach we take for, with Sapiens for Android is to remotely automate Android emulators across many machines. If we could remotely automate iOS simulators in the data center, then uh, Sapiens could run against tens or even hundreds of iOS simulators at the same time. Another impediment is that uh, the current iOS toolset often involves monolithic workflows that are sequenced from a small number of primitives. Sapiens only needs a handful of these uh, primitive tasks, such as um, tapping the user interface, entering uh, keyboard events, getting information about the UI state, uh, instead of a big monolithic workflow. In the standard tool chain, simulating touches is coupled to test execution, and test execution is coupled to builds. Uh, this makes automating this scenario for Sapiens harder than it needs to be. If instead we could break down these existing complex workflows into more granular primitives, it's far easier to automate an iOS simulator within the context of um, Sapiens machine learning uh, approach. And when we break down these workflows into smaller primitives, we can remove the burden of understanding how to use them, uh, understanding how uh, to use the big workflows, which makes uh, cross-platform uh, support far simpler. Something that's great about the uh, existing tooling is the rich and diverse range of developer tools available. However, some of this functionality is available exclusively in graphical user interfaces, otherwise known as a GUI. In order for Sapiens to understand what's visible on screen, Sapiens needs accessibility information at the operating system level. This is only available in the Accessibility Inspector graphical user interface. For test execution, Sapiens needs a way of um, simulating touches at, at a very low latency. Uh, this is only available when clicking your mouse within a graphical user interface. There are even cases where a GUI doesn't exist at all. Um, for example, Sapiens needs a way of obtaining crash logs from a simulator. Uh, this doesn't exist in the standard toolchain either. If all the functionality that we needed was instead exposed over a command line interface, otherwise known as a CLI, then it becomes much easier for um, components such as Sapiens to integrate with us. Uh, implementing a small, uh, 
set of GUI-only um, primitives within a CLI uh, will enable Sapiens to run against iOS simulators. So to solve these problems, we started up a project called the iOS Development Bridge, or IDB. This is a key part of how we run Sapiens against iOS simulators. So let's take a closer look at how, how we solved some of these problems. Firstly, we automate remotely with re remote procedure calls, otherwise known as RPC. There are many uh, cross-platform, cross-language RPC frameworks, or, uh, many of which are open source too. IDB uses gRPC, uh, as it has uh, support for all the languages that uh, IDB is built in, as well as support for bidirectional uh, data streams. And streaming data is very important when you need to provide progress about a long-running operation, uh, as well as l moving large amounts of data around, such as when you're installing an application. IDB exposes all of its functionality over a command line interface. Um, all of the functionality that it does expose are indeed these small primitives that can then be uh, composed on top of to build more complicated workflows, uh, as is the case with Sapiens. IDB's CLI aims to be self-documenting so that engineers can rapidly build out their automation workflows without reading through pages and pages of documentation just to get started. This CLI is built on top of a Python client, which means that if the automation is itself um, written in Python, then uh, the Python client can also be used directly. Um, Python also runs on a massive range of platforms, so we don't need to run this component on the machine hosting the iOS simulator. For functionality that is missing or GUI only in the standard iOS toolchain, IDB builds on top of the FE Simulator Control project. FE Simulator Control is a Facebook open source project. Uh, it's a framework that's uh, been around for a few years now. And we've used it to make Objective-C APIs for these missing and GUI-only uh, pieces of functionality. And over the lifetime of the project, we've expanded its scope uh, to include device support in the FB Device Control Project uh, framework. Uh, and this means that IDB can uh, expose many of the same primitives on iOS devices as well. In fact, device support is very important for us at Facebook. We have racks of physical devices in the data center. Uh, they exist because there are um, kinds of automations that need the characteristics of a physical iOS device instead of just a simulator. Now, if we have a network of iOS devices and simulators in the data center, how does IDB fit all of this together? Let's first start with the iOS device or simulator that we want to automate. Uh, we call this the iOS runtime. This simulator or device needs to be available to other machines in the data center. We do this through a component called the IDB Companion. This is a gRPC server that binds with the FE Simulator Control or FE Device Control frameworks um, and uses them to execute remote actions issued over gRPC. There's one companion per device or simulator uh, by design uh, this is because it gives us uh, better isolation when there are multiple simulators or devices running on the same uh, Mac host. These are the only components that have to run on a Mac. Uh, the companion may have a close relationship with iOS, but the gRPC commands can indeed come from another machine. So where do these uh, commands come from? Well, it comes from a component called the IDB daemon. This is a stateful process that understands where companions are located and how to route commands to them. The daemon talks to the companion over gRPC, uh, as the companion may also be on another machine. We finally have the IDB command line. Uh, this is the interface that uh, is used by automation. So this is what Sapiens calls out to. Since we want to be able to uh, run the daemon and command line anywhere, it's written in Python, and it's the uh, gRPC client of the companion. Since these components may run on different machines, we need a way of providing IDB companions to automations that wish to execute actions against them. At Facebook, uh, as, or, as Andrea already mentioned, we have something called uh, OneWorld. Um, this is what we use to manage a large and diverse array, a range of runtimes and provide them to automations. 
These runtimes include Android emulators, Android devices, iOS simulators, iOS devices, uh, and even things such as Oculus headsets. Given this diversity of runtimes, uh, there need to be automate, uh, interfaces uh, available to make them available for automation. For iOS, IDB is this interface. You can learn uh, a bit more about One World from a talk that my colleague Evan gave at the At Scale conference in um, September 2018. So we want to give engineers signal on their code changes uh, as fast as possible. And we can do this by running many automations in parallel. Each automation requires an iOS runtime. So to scale up, we need to increase the number of available runtimes. Each Mac host can run a handful of runtimes. This increases the uh, available number of runtimes in the data center, um, as well as extracts the maximum amount of utility from these machines. And to scale up further, we can repeat this pattern again and again and again across many machines. These factors multiply uh, to give us an even greater number of runtimes. This capacity becomes very necessary when uh, automating against the uh, large numbers of uh, code changes uh, that are made by engineers of Facebook. So I've already mentioned Sapiens, where, there's an, uh, where IDB is used as an API for automating the UI, uh, collecting accessibility information and crashes, but that's only part of the story. We have categories of tests that don't require a full testing framework. Uh, and are, are instead interested in detecting changes to the visual appearance of our applications. And we call these tests snapshot tests. In order to make this automation work, IDB exposes commands to launch applications and to collect screenshots at any point in time. We also have a range of conventional units, uh, integration, and end-to-end -end tests. Um, with so many tests to run on, on code changes, dividing up uh, these tests up against a pool of iOS simulators means that we can get uh, test results far sooner through parallelizing them. Um, as the client side of IDB can be run on Linux machines, the test orchestration level doesn't even need to run on a Mac either. Um, test output is uh, also incrementally reported and machine readable. Uh, this is very important when it comes to reporting results back to users. And it's not just uh, um, automation within the data center that IDB supports. Uh, we also use it for developer environments and tools. So Facebook has an open source project called Flipper. Um, it's a visual debugger, um, also open source, um, that uh, uses IDB primitives to power and build its user interface. Uh, build tools such as Buck um, also benefit from the test execution and debugging primitives that uh, IDB provides. And developers can even use uh, IDB commands directly in a terminal. Um, just running IDB log in, in a terminal with an attached iOS device will stream output to the terminal um, very fast. I also previously mentioned the device racks in our data center. Facebook uses these devices in an uh, automated performance regression uh, system called Mobile Lab. Um, and using IDB's uh, test execution and uh, file manipulation primitives, we can collect performance metrics uh, from devices in our data center and analyze them on other machines to do uh, heavy data processing work in order to detect any regressions that happen to performance. There's a very uh, good post about this in Facebook's engineering blog as well. Um, as I've already mentioned, uh, a few of the IDB commands that we use internally, um, you, you could uh, find out more if you ran, if you're a Facebook engineer and you ran IDB dash dash help, uh, then you'd get all of this output. As you can see, there's quite a lot of them. Um, but don't worry, you don't have to read all of them because IDB is now open sourced. Um, and uh, yeah, check out our GitHub page where you'll find everything that you need to get started and a whole lot more. I'd also like to thank uh, everyone who's made getting this out the door possible. Uh, it's been a mammoth eff effort and uh, it's, it's really great to get it out. There are two sessions covering both IDB and Infer this afternoon. So please come along if you want to find out how to leverage IDB and Infer in your own projects and release process. Uh, I believe there'll also be a short Q&A afterwards um, at uh, 1 p.m. Um, in the open source area. 
So thank you very much. Um, it was a great pleasure talking to you today. Um, yeah, so thank you. Cheers.